Join me, Phil Stephanie and Russell Gerber on an interactive show designed to give you more insight and context to all things African. On point today, the small and unusual animals on African. Okay, good afternoon everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Phil Stephanie. Russell is still man down. He'll be back with us next week, I'm sure. But we've brought in a special guest. We've got Peter, who's one of the partners of Africam. We're gonna give him and give him a test run and see what he thinks of some of the small and unusual animals we see on Africam. How are you doing, Pete? How's it, Phil? Um, great to be here um, behind the microphone. Um, I'm often on the other side listening and enjoying the shows. So excited about um, finding out about the small and unusual animals that you don't often uh, catch on the cameras. Uh, great to have you here, Pete. It turns out that I think nearly 25 years ago, while Pete was establishing Africam, I was starting my career as a guide at Pinda with CC Africa. So it's quite nice to be back in the mix with, with you again. So Pete, we've got um, a couple of yeah interesting small sightings. You know, we often talk about the big stuff there. Obviously, we've, we've done a predator show. Uh, we've done elephants of Tembi. But this show is all about the small and unusual and also the diversity that we see on, on the camera. So here is a classic example. We've got woolly neck stalks. We've got elephants. This is a tembi, by the way, folks. I'm sure those of you that watch the cameras on a regular basis, you'll recognize it. This is from the winter months. We've got some zebras. So a lovely mix of things on the cameras as they do obviously film. 24-7 and what's quite interesting I'm sure you'll all see as we move on through the show that a lot of the things are nocturnal um, the things that we miss that elephant <laughs> getting a little bit excited there to get in the water and you'll also notice that this is a great example of how you know the things we see that they get there's no disturbance whatsoever they're just carrying on on their the natural life cycle, giving us a great opportunity yeah, to get the whole mix of things. Folks, also just to remind you uh, that if you have any questions as usual that, that are relevant to the show, you know, some of the animals we're going to be discussing and having a look at are quite unusual. And if you do have any questions, just uh, put them in the question box and let's see if we can have some discussion around the different animals, some of the small critters. Like this one here, the vervet monkey. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen that before, Pete. I don't need to ask you, but I'm going to ask you some questions later. So I hope you've got your, your thinking cap on. Well, there's nothing. I mean, they are very mischievous uh, critters, actually. And uh, uh, folks, I think uh, when I was probably last with Phil and with Russell, actually, we all worked for a previous company. Um, I was I was in the office, unfortunately, sitting behind computers while they were uh, driving guests around in in Land Rovers. But uh, just uh, I thought, I'd, while we're looking at this vivid monkey, you know, Phil. Uh, was responsible, uh, he was a senior guard and he was responsible for training a lot of the, the junior rangers and he had quite a mischievous reputation, often used to play tricks on them. So, um, yeah, just thought I'd bring that up <laughs> while we're looking at the vervet monkey. While we're looking at the vervet monkey. Yeah, well, it was actually the vervet monkey's fault that I was playing a trick on everyone else when I first started guiding at 19 that I lost my first job. but. They thought I wasn't too clear on what I would want to do, but I'm still here, 25 or 26 years later, <laughs> enjoying all these wonderful sightings. What I really like about this beat, this bit of clip, is the detail we can see this mm. monkey, and also the detail then in that case, how much it's looking and cleaning itself. Yeah. And here's another great clip of a, well, do you know what that is, Pete? 
Here goes the questions. All right. Um, okay, so Phil, I'm going to have a go at this. Um, I would say that that is a civet. Ooh. I don't know if there's anyone out there watching. If we have any other, <laughs> <laughs> any other answers, I'll say you're wrong. Um, but if anyone else is, knows what that might be, um, I'll let you know in about a minute or so. We don't have too many, too much time with each animal because there's lots. But it's such a beautiful animal. We do get to see them relatively regularly at various waterholes. They're very widespread. Um, and you can see it's got a very long tail, so it spends a fair amount of time up in trees. In fact, they nest up in trees. So during the day, that's why you don't see them during the day, is they're up in the trees um, nesting. They make little little areas to sleep, but they will also sleep in small holes. But then they'll come out at night and spend a lot of the night um, feeding on all sorts of things from little insects uh, to spiders to scorpions. There's quite an interesting clip coming up just now. I don't know, what do you make of that, Pete? Oh, that's beautiful, Phil. Incredible. Wow. What do you think's going on? Can you see anything yeah, interesting in nah, this? Yeah, I can see that. Looks like a python of some yeah, sort. Yeah, exactly. It's an African rock python. It's very unusual bit of footage this I don't see if anyone's written what the what the other animal is but it's really interesting to see yes Sally you got it and Suki Janet oh Pete you're gonna have to work on that <laughs> yeah but it's a large spot of Janet and in this case it's a really interesting bit of footage this how it definitely knows there's danger it, uh, it remember it's completely dark so this genet is working on sound it's working on scent they do have pretty good eyesight but this is at Olifant's river where it's in the shadows or in the real shade and it's quite a smart genet it's definitely realized that that's a little bit too much for it to handle but I reckon he's maybe giving it some thought how could I eat that because they will go for smaller snakes uh, as part of their diet but in this case, it's very smart, Janet, because it could come off second best. That's a very big python. Um, it's often a discussion or a topic brought up, and I've got some nice uh, footage at the end of the show. Two different snakes, some of the unusual things we see. Also, just a question on that. Would the, would the Janet uh, be on the python's menu, on a big python, python's menu? Yeah, the python is highly... Um, highly opportunistic so if the genet's not careful uh, and the pythons will also climb trees like you see this genet up in the trees hunting and searching through these weaver nests but a python would definitely um, make short work of a genet probably have to watch out it doesn't get bitten mm. but essentially uh, that genet made a good call there get out of the way yeah okay. um but yeah talking about them climbing trees we've seen this a couple of times here at tembi really working hard you can just see the eyes shining back at us but these genets and a lot of the other animals we're going to be looking at are very crafty um, they spend a lot of their night you know they'll scratch for grubs they'll move logs out the way and in that case we'll see well we saw how they get it trying to get into the weaver's nest and here's just a perfect shot of the large spotted genet. The large spotted genet has actually got to do with the size of the genet, not the spots itself. It's not dissimilar to the birding world. The lesser spotted genet actually has bigger spots, but is a smaller animal. So it is a little confusing there. I thought I wouldn't throw that curveball at you. <laughs> but um, those of you that have cats at home, this is a very uh, uh, probably quite a, a like a picture. But actually, genets are closer towards the mongoose. Um, but just like this, yeah, Pete, that's a civet. Okay. They're actually in their own category, uh, civets, genets. Um, this civet does look more or less like a cat, but it's on its own, in its own world. And again, wonderful clip. And something, we see them relatively often on the cameras, but to see them out during the day or get great photographs or footage like this is almost impossible. So Phil, just uh, for the folks out there and for myself, um, if you look at the 
the genet and the civet, uh, if you had to compare them in size to a domestic cat, um, how would they stack up? Uh, yeah, no, in terms of um, the size, this civet is about 20 kgs and okay. the, the, the genet is only about two or three, a big male. So he's quite a lot bigger, this, this civet. Then you've got the African wildcat that we'll see a bit later. We've got a white mongoose, but the civet's the biggest and heaviest of the lot. And what's interesting about the civet, if you have a look at that hair on its back, he actually doubles him si himself in size when he's threatened. And I suspect what's going on in this clip is that they are so aware of scent. You see he's smelling everywhere. Yeah. He's smelling the air, he's smelling the ground. And every now and then you see that his hackle's getting up. So he's very likely smelling another male genet. They're highly territorial. Sorry, civet. Yep. They're highly territorial. Um, he could be smelling a leopard. This is at Rosie's pan. We know there's a lot of leopard activity around there, but he doesn't seem too scared. He's, he's almost intrigued. He's spending a lot of time around here, and they scent mark a lot of the time. There's a wonderful footage mm. now have a, of a civet having a drink. <laughs> And, and Phil, so what, uh, you know, uh, in terms of predators, um, what would uh, a civet be scared of mostly? I would say the biggest problem for civet, um, I have seen leopards actually feeding on them. I've never seen lions catch them or anything like that. I do think that they, that they probably get away with quite a lot in terms of being preyed on. That hair can stand right up and they've got quite a horrendous roar. That will put a lot of animals off. It's not dissimilar to a honey badger that manages to stand its own. But I would say the biggest problem for a civet would be leopard. And leopard are more likely to ambush and try and catch a variation of foods as opposed to lion. I don't think would worry too much about something the size of a civet unless, of course, it's desperate. You know, a big old male lion that's been um, battling to feed itself might give it a try. I reckon uh, a, a civet, they, they do quite well. They're quite confident when you do see them like this, walking around. They're not shy. Almost feel like they own the space. <laughs> but beautiful markings. Beautiful. You see, this yeah. one doesn't have his hackles up yeah. like that other one. This one's at Naledi. It's also having a smell. You often see them scent marking and smelling the side of that well. Um, I think this particular one doesn't actually spray. They've got very powerful scent glands, um, and they, they scent a lot on either across onto the wall of that, or they also, you might have heard of a civetry, mm -hmm. where they defecate in the same place. Um, very typical of territorial animals. In fact, a lot of these nocturnal animals, these special ones, like this here, for example, is the African wildcat. They're highly territorial. And one thing that's also quite interesting is that we see that they are often on their own. So this is a really special, one of my favorite animals actually is an African wildcat. What's interesting here is you can see a really black tip on the end of the tail when it walks and also black feet. Yeah. And that is one of the characteristics that make an African wildcat uh, an African wildcat as opposed to a house cat. Now there's a lot of talk out there that there's actually very very few naturally occurring or 100% or genes of African wildcats because um, they've been highly inbred with domestic cats but if you look at this fellow right here that black tip on the end of the tail that watch when it walks um, you'll see that it's got lovely black feet. In fact, the under part of their feet, their pads are also black as opposed to a lot of domestic cats are pinkish but to see these, the only place I've really seen them during the day is in the Khalakhali National Park or Central Botswana. But otherwise, to see these is really special. And of course, they're really shy. So the fact that we're sitting behind the camera here watching them like this is, um, is how come we get to see them relatively often, but they're not that common. Mm. So this one... It's hunting and, and spending a lot of time in the grass here. That lapwing at the back, by the way, doesn't seem to be too bothered. But an African wildcat could try and go for birds for sure, raid nests, little chicks. Um, I would say things like guinea fowl babies are not safe with this cat around. But then, of course, there's rodents. And yeah, look how slowly this cat's moving through the open air. And remember, it's dark. It's completely mm. pitch dark, right? Uh, the, that you can see... 
that shining back of the eyes it's the reflective tapetum that all these nocturnal creatures has have and as he looks into the camera you can see that shines right the way back and that's just a, a layer at the back of the eye that captures light and sends it back into the eye to be processed and therefore the light spends more time essentially in the eye and here he's using his ears Phil, um, just as a uh, just a question for you. So, um, in terms of calling and and sounds, um, does does it sort of resemble a domestic cat, or is it slight, slightly different? They do exactly like a domestic cat. They're very soft meows. Okay. But their biggest way of communication is scent marking, which again is not dissimilar to a domestic cat or a leopard, for that matter. They do a lot of scent marking, and so they work out quite quickly who's in whose territory and at what point, and then they have a call. Okay. And that's not dissimilar to this fellow over here. Do you know what that is, Pete? Here we go. Another question. I can't actually see my, my eyes on great, but I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for yeah. Well, you can wait. You can it looks wait. like, okay, so it looks like a mongoose. Okay, we'll me. give you half a mark for that. Striped mongoose. Oh, striped mongoose, I don't know. Let's put it back out to the floor. Okay, well, let me have a check. Folks, uh, he's just refreshing the answer box here. If anyone has an idea what we're looking at here. Again, it's a generally speaking something you don't see that often at all. On the cameras, on the other hand, we do get to see these little critters relatively regularly, especially in the winter months as the grass gets lower and lower, so we'll start to see more activity, I suspect, of these small critters. Um, Phil, I'm just noting here, Christy mentions that a few years ago on the cameras they captured a leopard grabbing a civet Yeah, at uh, Rosie's pan. It's so. interesting that, uh, Christy, because it, it is one of the few things that if one had to say all of these, actually, even a, a, a African wildcat, this animal right here, we'll just wait and see if anyone knows what this is but all of these little critters have one thing to really worry about and that's a leopard and again like i say leopards are very likely they'll go for anything from uh, uh, porcupines to mice um, to sometimes catfish um, so for a leopard to try and catch one of these small animals does seem to be their biggest worry and quite interesting that you actually saw that on the cameras fantastic so Here's some interesting, again, behavior. There's, this is courtship, talking about those um, African wildcats and how do they communicate. So a lot of these animals don't have big communication. They don't roar. You know, they don't want to give away their position too much. Um, but what they will do, there's a lot of scent marking. And once they find each other like that, I suspect the smaller one is a female in estrus. And here they are hoping for some activity for the next generation. But again, if one had to be there uh, in person, you'd often chase the animals off with the sound of the vehicle and that sort of thing. So it's actually, I've never seen um, these animals. There's a good view. Mm. Pete, do you want to go for another guess? Are you, are you happy with your first answer? Well, I see we haven't had any, uh, any of our folks uh, uh, put forward a response. Maybe a... Oh, I want to say it's a banded mongoose, but I'm I'm, oh, I'm, okay. I'm struggling. Okay. We, we're going to wait a bit for some, I'm sure there's some experts out there. Because I, I'm going to compare it just now to the banded mongoose. We've got some great footage on banded mongoose. So, okay. uh, there we go. We do have some answers. Christy, whitetail mongoose. Suki, brilliant. Sally, you're on it. Pete? You got to spend some more time <laughs> in the bush. Get away from that desk. <laughs> <Quite rush. laughs> yeah, it's a white-tailed mongoose, and the white tail again is a giveaway. The banded mongoose you're going to see just now clearly has bands. Now this is another one. Here's another trick question. Let's put it back out to to the public. A wonderful view, and we've often seen this fellow being quite cheeky. Now snakes. I don't think it would go for the python, but this particular mongoose is very famous for one-on-one -on -one taking out some pretty large snakes. I've seen them taking out puff adders, and we'll see at the end of the show how big a puff adder actually is. But that's a, a smaller mongoose, a solitary mongoose, as opposed to 
the banded mongoose and the dwarf mongoose. But let's see if anyone knows what that mongoose was. We've uh, Paul, can I? Sorry, I've just got a question on that. Oh, there we go. That's the bandit. Eh? There we go. Yeah. Okay. Is that your question? No, the question I wanted to ask you is: um, Do do the, uh, the 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 mong the the, the mongoose who uh, sort of attack snakes and they're quite uh, brave? Do they have some sort of resistance, or have they built up some sort of resistance against the poisons if they get bitten, or are they just incredibly nimble because um, they've got a high success rate in catching snakes? Yeah, quite. An, that's an interesting question because, as far as I know, there's no there's no uh, ability to break down venom. The only thing that I know has been tested and it's pretty well accepted is the honey badger. And uh, we've got a short clip of honey badger coming up. Um, but as far as mongoose is concerned, if you if you saw battle, and there, there's quite a few examples out there of mongoose attacking snake, they are really, really uh, nimble and they mm. just the snake just doesn't have a chance. The mongoose also are quite smart in, in positioning themselves. And, of course, a group like this, uh, look how many, just just while we're going, look how many come out of this bundle of mm. mongoose. <laughs> Incredible. Yeah, I think I counted 11. Uh, it's quite smart, actually, how they huddle up because they need to watch out for things like martial eagles. Uh, snake eagles will sometimes go for them as well so they do have to watch out but they've got eyes and ears lots of them lots of lookouts so they'll give a, a quite a bit of calling actually talking about audio and and how these animals communicate so banded mongoose compared to a white-tailed mongoose or that slender mongoose uh, which is was that individual one these guys you can actually hear them before you see them in fact some days uh, when we have no wind out on the cams, um, you can actually hear them uh, chattering away. And if a raptor flies over, you'll definitely hear the panic. It's quite a high-pitched rattling sound, and everyone dashes for cover. But in, yep. Paul, do they, um, similar to, to meerkats, do they um, put a sentry up or, you know, on, on higher ground keeping watch? That's exactly right. So any group like... Uh, meerkats and these family units of mongoose they'll have positions in their family and one of them is to be the lookouts usually the younger males will sit up on the top of termite mounds on one of these fallen branches keeping a good lookout they will however once one animal the feeders once they start looking and they find something to feed on they'll call those to come and eat and then they'll go back and do their jobs talking about alarm calling and being quite vocal this is a little tree squirrel. Now, we've seen lots of action and lots of activity on tree squirrels at various water holes, but this particular one is gathering nesting material. You see how it's collecting that in its mouth and it's using its, its forearms, and then it's going to go up and into that tree um, where, where I haven't seen any very little babies yet, so we'll, we'll look out for it, but it's really quite special to see these animals, but also to see them in action. Paul, just before we got to the banded mongoose, we've uh, we've had some responses uh, to that uh, that snake, uh, small snake mongoose. We've got uh, the option of a slender mongoose or Indian grey mongoose. Uh, it's a slender mongoose, yeah, Sally. You you got. I think you're on full marks there, Sally. <laughs> keep keep it up. Yeah, that's a slender mongoose, and the giveaway there is that long thin tail with a black marking at the end of its tail. Really quick and, and definitely way more slender than those mm. banded mongoose. Um, the dwarf mongoose are also a similar color, but much smaller and live in groups. Yeah. Um, so on the other hand, these little squirrels, they either in family groups or on their own young males. This one's making short work of the marula fruit. So going from one animal to the next, completely different, but something unusual. And talking about catfish getting fed on, we saw some catfish this um, summer walking across open area. Before the rains came at Tau, the crocodiles were feeding like crazy on catfish. So this was something unusual to see. It's not a small critter. The, cro the crocodile 
but it is an unusual sighting up until watching these cameras. Um, you don't often see uh, crocodiles feeding on much, but here we see there's this clip of this crocodile, I think got more mud than catfish there. <laughs> I'm just reading a question here by Sally Hornbills and hmm? do you work together? Is it correct for predators? So the hornbills and dwarf mongoose, quite interesting. I would say that the, that the, the hornbills will follow the mongoose um, because the mongoose, they, you know, they'll scratch up and, and move rocks and move wood out the way. And they may, let's say the, the spider or something takes a left run for it and the mongoose is, I mean, the hornbill's close by and manages to capitalize on that. So you'll often see them feeding together. In fact, there's, you'll often see birds hanging about, uh, all birds, even the starlings, big groups of banded mongoose or dwarf mongoose. Not so much the, the individuals because they don't cause so much stir. Talking about hanging about you, this... Uh, Heron is hoping for a bit of movement as these crocodiles are feeding again on catfish. So this is just really interesting behavior, uh, something you just don't see where the, when, you, when you're out on game drive or anything like that. You often see crocodiles on the banks. But I thought um, yeah, I've always been quite interested in, in the movement of animals. And what do they actually do? That heron is hoping for a bit of movement, not dissimilar to a combination of hornbills and uh, and mongoose uh, didn't really get anything there, but the crocodile sure did. Just have a look there. That crocodile got himself another catfish, <laughs> slowly feeding themselves up and getting ready for the big rains. Now look at this from one reptile to the next. People have often asked the questions, do we get to see snakes? And I tell you what, just look at this. If you, I guess those that don't like snakes, this is probably, the best way to view them. <laughs> I don't know how many uh, pythons you've ever seen, Pete. You... Yeah, look, I mean, uh, the point you made is so valid for when you're, in a, uh, when you're on a self-drive or you're in the back of a, a land cruiser or a land rover, you know, often you can't get near the python because it's uh, you're on a road and you, you can't go into the bush or you actually disturb the animal and its natural behavior. So um, it's always just great to watch our cameras um, and watch animals undisturbed um, where the cameras are almost part of the ecosystem. So really cool to see this. I've yeah. seen quite a few in trees, but they've been stationary. Yes, actually that's true. They do like to be in trees. I've actually seen twice how pythons sit in water holes and use that as a platform to hunt. They curl up and wait for something to come and have a drink. Um, and just to see a python, they're highly endangered species, right? They're not, they're not common at all. Um, they, they often get hunted, unfortunately, by humans for, for food or for body parts. It's another whole can of worms there. But to see this fellow slowly coming out the water is quite something. I actually, uh, I think three days after this python was seen, I went to that spot and measured the steps. It was three and a half meters. And this is another pretty hardcore snake that we in, in fact it's quite common it's a it's a puff adder and this is a great example of a very large puff adder indeed and mm. um, that probably measures about a meter or so in length look how fat it is i reckon it's just fed on on a mouse or something but um again to, to answer the question of do we see snakes these are two great examples beautiful views and I would say as safe as it gets. <laughs> yeah, look, Paul, I mean, you don't want to step on that snake, that's for sure. Stephanie, I just want to answer your one question before we get to the end of the show today. Um, yeah, it is quite strange. To, you know, you wouldn't have thought that the catfish get caught on a regular basis, but catfish are actually very high on the, on the diet of crocodiles. And what, what's been happening at Tao, what happens when the water gets too shallow, those catfish essentially are on more mud than water, if that makes sense. And then the crocs move together and they are quite quick on the grab. And so um, 
as the water starts going down, so like now, we might see some more activity. Uh, as I say, I haven't actually seen it before, uh, before looking at the cameras, but it is something that does happen relatively uh, regularly. Folks, it looks like it's, uh, we've come to the end of the show today. Pete? Yeah, Phil, thanks very much. It's been a real pleasure hanging out with you and, and with uh, the audience out there. Um, what have we got in store on point for next week? So next week, Pete, we're going to go for birds. We're going to do all things feathers. And uh, again, there's some amazing things that we get to see, different bird activity and different birds indeed. So next week, folks, we're going to be on point with uh, all things feathers, birds on African. Wonderful. Can't wait. Pete, you better do some brushing up. We'll, we'll send you some more questions. Thanks for being with us today, Pete. Thanks, everybody. I hope you have a great day further. And I'll catch up with you tomorrow on the Hyde Show and see what else we see on the cams. Have a great day, folks.